This is the Blackout Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Blackout Podcast where I get to talk to amazing people that do awesome things. Um, And today I have Katrine Victoria Taylor on the podcast. Thanks for coming in. You're welcome. So, I remember seeing your work on um, on Instagram and thinking, okay, this is just so much work. And that was when I actually thought that you had kind of everything just made out and then you just print it. And then I reached out to you and talked about it and then I found out you literally have to make each individual letter to do that printing thing. I was like, oh yeah, that's just crazy. I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't usually make each individual letter although that's something i'd like to learn how to do and it's on my bucket list (laughs) um but we have a collection of type and or known as all the letters or sorts yeah um and i assemble them together so every letter you see has to be placed um and adjusted okay i should not say me but but still like basically each letter is an individual person right you know individual piece so if it's like 50 words or whatever on the work it's actually 50 little letters that you do right yeah yeah so it's a lot of work and how how did you even get into doing this oh um i always say like letterpress kind of found me um it wasn't something i was expecting to do i did a BFA at NASCAD University, mm-hmm. where I primarily focused on textiles and jewelry. Oh, wow. Um, although I, my degree is interdisciplinary. Mm. So, like, I did, I, I always joke I couldn't make up my mind. <laughs> um, and so then I took a bookbinding class. And I often joke bookbinding is one of the most inter interdisciplinary crafts you'll ever find because Uh um, depending on what kind of books you make you work with wood metal cloth leather using all kinds of different skills Mm -hmm. and book arts is what brought me to letterpress printing um, at the Dawson print shop where I spend far too much time and work (laughs) Um, (laughs) I (laughs) there are several antique printing presses Mm. um, that my mentor Joe Landry like kind of not so slowly pushed me (laughs) towards doing Um, it's funny a lot of this all of this kind of started because I took um, a letterpress class and thought it was kind of fun Mm. um, and then graduated um, but I heard that at the Dawson print shop, they print the degrees. And Ooh. so I started hanging out in hopes that I could help print my own degree, which I did. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> and, uh, I set my name out of metal type and then ran it through the press. Um, and ever since then, I've kind of been hooked, hanging out, following Joe Landry around, um, learning as much as I can about, um, printing, book binding, and all the other adjacent kind of skills to letterpress, whether it's um, mechanics or uh, paper making or <laughs> anything. It, are the machines loud? Um, they're not terribly loud. Okay. Um, in the case of um, my Vandercook, it does have a motor in it that runs um, kind of an inking system. Mm. Um and you'll hear sometimes I always tease the students. I'm like, listen to your press, like, cause, cause they'll let you know it needs something. Like if like it's, what? um, like if it's in need of oil, it'll like make <laughs> little squeaky, like crying sounds at you. <laughs> I'm just like the press, she needs something. Let's, let's, it's, yeah, it's very important. You also have to listen for anomalies and kind of the noise, like, if all of a sudden your press starts making a weird k- kunk noise, Something is something's going on. up, and like yeah. you gotta investigate and do something about it. Because, How old is the press? Um, the my favorite press is just over sixty years old or so. Wow! You can tell by its serial number. Um, there's a place you can look it up, uh, the Vander blog, which is run by a friend and mentor of mine, Paul Moxon, and he has all this kind of range of serial numbers listed that gives kind of the approximate year or something was made. Oh, wow. What was the machine made? 
Um, like what country? The America. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So all Vandercooks, as far as I know, were produced in Chicago, Illinois. Mm. And <clears throat> so you took this class and I'm like, oh, this is fun. Printed your degree, which is super amazing. <laughs> How did you actually get to work at the uh, print shop? Um, well, that's kind of I. I guess it all started, like I said, because I was following Joe, Joe around. Um, he is so generous with his time and his knowledge, and I just started working on little projects with him. So it first started kind of working individually with him mm. on different projects for different clients. Um, for example, one of the first big projects I helped him with is that um, he did work for the Book of Negroes miniseries. Oh, what did he do on that? So we made the book that is the Book oh. of Negroes, and I helped him with that. I sewed the book and helped do some of the finishing on the book. When you say sort of sew the book, what do you mean? Um, well, traditionally... Books are sewn together in folded sections. Um, so all the paper um, is kind of folded in pairs. That's when you think about imposition and things like that. And then it's it's sewn with linen thread, either on linen tapes or cords usually. So basically, like this guy you brought today, mm -hmm. what would be the process of making this guy? So that book there is kind of... Not even halfway finished. So oh, I wow. started off with um, getting big sheets of paper, folding them, um, folding them up and cutting them down so that they make little like folded sections or individual pamphlets. Mm -hmm. And then I punched holes in all of them that correspond to um, this one sewn on linen tapes, for example, mm -hmm. which is a more modern technique, but it ensures for like a longer lasting book um if you've ever seen sometimes you'll see an older book that was sewn on cords and you can see it like worn right through the leather or the the boards are it's like out. come right off yeah. and you can kind of see it poking through or traditionally like if you're looking at like an old fancy leather book um they have these raised bands on the spine mm. that was initially kind of primarily like in the medieval period um, so like the cords that the book was sewn on and then the leather went over top of that mm. although that eventually um, book binding techniques developed and um, the French wanted more control over the design of their binding so they figured out how to like sink the cords and then just put fake leather bands everywhere so not every like raised band you see it is is, is structural because mm. um, they wanted to allow for more like creativity if you will oh um, okay. but yeah and then it's a matter of sewing it i usually sew you can sew what's bench sewing sewing by hand at a table or a workbench um, but i also um, do a really traditional method of using a sewing frame, which is this big wooden frame, and these tapes would be kind of suspended between um, the top and bottom of it. So they were hold, held really taut um, so that when you sew, you get a really compact sewing, tight sewing, right. um, which makes later processes easier. So you said this book is barely done. What's left to do with it? Um, ooh, well, this book needs to be rounded and backed, which... Um, not all books, but a lot of older books you probably have seen have like a rounded oh, spine. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I would coat this in some sort of type of adhesive. Traditionally, that would be an animal glue. Um, thankfully, we don't really use animal glue anymore because it's real stinky. Um, <laughs> yeah. Joe, my mentor, he's always like, he's like, oh, yeah. You think animal glue smells, you should smell it before they put, they put like perfume in it to make it smell better. And it still <laughs> smells horrible. It's like, it's even worse. What's it, like, how's it made? What's it, how, is, what's it made from? The made animal from, glue? Um, I believe like, like quite literally animal <laughs> bones. You know, when they used to make jokes about sending horses to the glue factory? I don't know if you've ever oh, heard no, that. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. So they go... Grind our bones and yeah, make it. but I use a uh, PVA, which is polyvinyl acetate, which is uh, kind of a plastic-based oh, okay. um, adhesive. So 
Um, although we do use other animal products depending on the binding because I do a lot of work in leather. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, so you coat the spine, round it, yeah. and then put um, put it in a, a press that's almost like a vice. It's funny, in my line of work, there's probably at least half a dozen things called a press. There's finishing <laughs> presses, copy presses, printing presses, different types of printing presses. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, just everything's called a press. Yeah. A lot mm. of things squish things in different ways. Oh, okay, okay, um, okay. But yeah, it'll hold the book and then I use a hammer to um, kind of curve over the edges to make shoulders um, so that it kind of... It gives more strength to the book. It also, um, if you're doing certain kind of binding, allows kind of the spine to flow like gently into um, the the boards, mm -hmm. like with the covers front and back of the book. Wow. That is a long, long, long process. Yeah. So Every now, do, do, they, do they print on the book before they do this whole book binding thing? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, whenever okay. you print, it's in flat sheets oh, okay. um i haven't personally printed whole books i usually print either posters or what in letterpress we often call broadsides what which is just a fancy term for a poster with a lot more text on it so oh, okay. often you'll see like poetry broadsides where you'll print a whole poem and there'll probably be some imagery on oh, okay, the poster okay, okay, as well so wait uh, let me wrap my mind around that. The, for instance, this guy mm -hmm. has a lot of words. To make this one, you put all the individual letters on the press, and then the signs are those also um, kind of tiny pieces like that. Yeah. So in printing, um, we call those ornaments or other fun words for printers, flowers, or dingbats. <laughs> <laughs> What yeah, a... there's there's some funny terms. That, well, in any craft, they have like weird niche <laughs> terms. Mats. Okay. Yeah, so the decorative elements are. And then how? Also okay, the I guess so. They sit on the press in such a way that they don't pull out of the thing when the when the um when the well paper itself that's goes That's actually through. um an issue. So when I'm putting out the letters, mm. I also have to put what I didn't bring here with the type is we also have to put space material so every bit of white space you ah, see on that print is, is actually thing. filled with like a physical object oh yeah. my god so, it's, so like every square inch of that is filled with something that was placed by my hand hold on it's the stuff you see and so not like see. here is something yeah and in between the letters is something and Oh, man, yeah, that's... and you have to lock it up like a puzzle really tightly. And there are some presses, the press I primarily use is a proof press, so everything's flat. Mm -hmm. So I'm not worried about gravity. But there's other kinds of presses, um, platen presses, for example, where it all gets locked up in a frame called a chase. Mm -hmm. And you literally have to be able to like pick up that chase the frame and put it on a press so it has to be able to withstand <laughs> gravity because then the, the, the um the the letters might fall out yeah especially <laughs> if they're really tiny oh i'm sorry typically we don't do smaller than like four point tight oh <laughs> that's wow. pushing it wait so, so really tiny. like the one which one is i suck at this four point how small is that guy so that would be I believe that was 10 point. Oh, so, oh four is more super tiny. Then. Pretty tiny, pretty tiny. Um, For context, like, um, oh, what was I going to say? There's uh 72 points in an inch. Oh, so, that's really small. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> The, like, the like sizes you're used to on computer like kind of yeah, translate yeah. to the real, my weird real world <laughs> in like physical sizes. So um, type that's 72 points is like an, approximately an inch high. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now, <laughs> God damn, that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always joke okay. if you like repetitive, repetitive, um, tedious tasks. Like, <laughs> I've got some fun for you. Here, so here's the thing though. How do you, for, okay, so like this one, they're kind of, even these all blue, the color. Yeah. They're, they're like different versions of blue. 
How do how does the ink translate from the letter to the the paper itself? So um, on the press I use, there's an impression cylinder, and that's what kind of squishes the paper across the letters, or we call it the form. Once all the letters are assembled, the mm. finished product is kind of a form. Um, so in the case of that print, like that would have done been done in a single pass, and every color has to be a different pass and what you're seeing in different colors of blue is more because of the different weights of type or mm -hmm. how like the the word society is kind of shaded mm. it's kind of giving the impression that there's different tones of blue yeah, um, yeah. when really it's just the same one. Oh, it's just how it's i guess designed on the impression thing mm -hmm. yeah because that one has a lot of um a lot of different typefaces on mm. it kind of inspired by older printing styles oh wow still a lot of work though <laughs> yeah. I'm, not, I'm not gonna lie like that that piece itself even though it's quite small took yeah. me several days to do especially because um i'm quite fussy about design and if you set type and you don't like the design you can't just like like mm. highlight it, make it bigger <laughs> or what have you. You have to put it back and, and pull out again. new stuff. So if you're kind of fussing around with, um, especially that, like I said, because there's so Just many gotta, typefaces. Yeah, no man, there are many. Um, we always joke that's that's one of our favorite like quote unquote design rules to break in letterpress printing um i know like digital designers they're always like oh you don't want more than like two or three typefaces on a on a poster but in letterpress whatever it, like <laughs> you can pull it off in a different way and sometimes you have to because if you run out of sorts or uh, if you're out of sorts aka letters yeah, <laughs> say that comes from letterpress yeah, yeah, yeah um there's nothing you can do except like in theory buy more although some type is antique vintage you can't get it gone, anymore it's, gone. it's or or you might be able to track it down but it could take a while because it only happens if you know it pops up on ebay unless there's something people are still casting new because oh. um, there's other there's many other nerds like me and some people are <laughs> different instead of being like printers and book binders they're printers and typecasters or maker type oh. makers and that sort of thing Gosh, and this this is one of the Blackout podcast. Super cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, wooden, right? Yeah, so that's wood type. And do they have to be a certain height? Yes. Um. So traditionally, in kind of North America and like the UK, um, type is all um point nine one eight thousandths of an inch. <laughs> That's super specific. Why? Is it based on the machine itself? Or? Um, yeah. So, like, I, I'm i not the best at the story, but, like, years and years and years ago, because for a while, type was all different sizes, because mm. people were, were working independently with, like, their own crew of type cutters and type casters and... And every print shop kind of had their own thing going on, mm -hmm. but they kind of got together and decided on a standard so that they could share and trade That's material. That's so, so, so specific. Though. Yeah. In uh, continental Europe, type high is, um, was it? Not, oh, I just forgot. Uh, nine, nine, three, eight, oh, nine, two, okay. eight, nine, two, eight. <laughs> And then the other so, one's nine nine one eight. Oh, so a little bit. Yeah, so you have to watch if you buy type from Germany. Oh, it won't. You'll crush it on your press, which is something I I teach printing, and it's something you have to kind of watch out for is making sure students are setting things properly so type doesn't get crushed because once it's been crushed, it's, there's nothing you can really do about it. Yeah, huh. and we, you know, the stuff has been around for. Some of it decades, some of it over a hundred years. We're trying our best to keep it in good shape. <laughs> oh wow! Um, and when you, how many? Once you print the first one, it comes out. I'm like, oh yeah, this is great. I'm fine. Um, do you just add more ink and just let it keep rolling till you have the number? Pretty much. Um, so sometimes I will like 
check it multiple times and I can either do that with like a little bit of ink on press. I also, you're very right, I start with like a little bit of ink and slowly add more because if you get too much ink, you'll get kind of a sloppy impression and that oh. sort of thing. Um, which yeah, could be, what could be that. fine and that's what you're going for. But yeah. um, I do a lot of community printing. So I always encourage people to like, get the confidence to add ink themselves and sometimes they get a little overzealous and, <laughs> and like sometimes it adds to the beauty um and how long do, does the paint take to dry um it depends on what kind of ink you're using so oh. we use two main kinds of ink in my shop um one is um oil based and that actually is fast to dry, which is what? counter. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's counterintuitive because we're used to hearing like oil, oil paint if you're a painter. Yeah. yeah, so that dries faster because it evaporates into the air. So is is, is hot in the thing? Is it the machine, the pre the print, the press, press. itself? Is it hot? Um, not really. Oh, other okay, than the okay. fact that like there is a motor that would heat up a little bit, oh, okay, but okay, there's okay. nothing, there's no like heat setting process gotcha, in gotcha, the press gotcha. or anything like that. Um, but we also use rubber based ink and rubber based ink has to dry by being absorbed into the paper, um, which you have to watch on modern papers. If they're coated or glossy, it'll take even more time to dry. Whereas oh. traditionally you're printing on often like, kind of cotton rag paper so it just wants to like soak up all the moisture so uh, if okay. i lived in a like dry desert my printing would probably dry pretty quickly but in nova scotia <laughs> it depends on how humid it is <laughs> okay. um, our students give her a hard time because the answer to like almost every question in the print shop is it depends <laughs> <laughs> okay um, and you're teaching now yeah. How did you start teaching? Um, well, it's funny. I was actually, I've taught in different capacities be since before I was a printer, whether it was um, being a girl guide leader or, <laughs> you know, even in school, I was like a reading buddy and all these different things. And initially I thought when I, when I grew up that I'd be a like high school English teacher. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, Things have changed. Yeah. Um, so I kind of s slowly started teaching different community workshops um, and also helping and assisting Joe in his teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and then I moved on to teaching for NASCAD's extended studies oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, program. So like their night classes. Yeah. Um, and then recently in May, I've, I've here and there starting to pick up teaching uh credit courses at NASCAD. What are you, what course is that? Um, well, in May, I taught intro book binding. So making that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> so doing um, kind of introductory level stuff, oh, doing okay. a simple hardcover binding, um, all kinds. There's so many different bindings. Uh, unfortunately, so many that I probably will never Oh, make wow. them all. Um, there's so many different why variations so many, of is, oh, pro, oh, wow. Why so many different methods? Um, well, part of it is because I study bindings that were made all over the world. So different countries developed their own techniques. And gotcha. also as time went on, um, techniques for making books, just like anything, kind of got more complicated or or more, more structurally sound. Because mm. looking at early, like... Um, Joe often, when he talks about book history, he'll he'll talk about with students um, that the scroll is kind of like the first book, if you will, but it's not really in what we think of as book form. Mm. Um, and then eventually we moved on to like folded sheets. Um, and then, um, you know, you can fold just like a bunch of sheets together into one pamphlet or section. Yeah. The, then they moved on to multi-section books um, and different ways of attaching it, whether it's um, like kind of tacketing or um, this book we were talking about earlier that's on linen tapes is they're known as like a sewing support. Okay. Um, whereas there are uns kind of sewings without that additional support where they the threads just link into each other. Um, uh -huh. 
Coptic bindings for, are an example of this, or Ethiopian bindings, where each section kind of links into each other, and they have um, this really pretty, like, kind of link stitching on their spine. Mm. Wow. And some of the, I don't know, well, you, is it artwork? What do you even call it? Like, po, uh, you actually said the name, Broadside. Broadside. Is there anyone here that would be a Broadside? No. Um, this, I, I would all kind of call these posters yeah. because they've got shorter amounts of text. Oh, okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, they're still pretty special, especially like they're kind of not necessarily the finest examples of printing, but mm -hmm. they're printing that's very close to my heart because, um, it has, it kind of promotes, um, different activist causes and different and that, reasons. Yeah. And that's it. one thing you that's another thing I love about your Instagram, um, because of like the message you, you have there. And I was wondering what is the reason behind that? Um, I've always been a bit of, I don't know, a trouble causer <laughs> trouble and, um, had very strong ideas about justice and yeah. what's kind of important in this world and looking out for other people. Mm -hmm. Um, and printing finally gave me a real outlet for that. Um, I've like volunteered at different community organizations and gone to protests and things, but mm. sometimes I, um, I personally deal with anxiety. So sometimes loud protests aren't always comfortable for me to be mm. at. Um, or some, some days like I'm, I can be a bit of a hermit. And so I don't necessarily want to go out in the world as much. Yeah. Whereas feeling I can contribute with my posters, like this one, for example, I collaborated with, um, yeah, with uh, Black Power Hour, L Jones, and the the prisoners at Burnside for their prison protests last year, last August. And the NASCA one. Yeah, for the most recent NASCA strike, faculty yeah. strike. I mean, I wasn't sure what that was about. And, and I mean, I've talked to different people and it kind of bounced on to pay thing um pay as well as um also just rights especially for part-time faculty mm. um as i'm sure you're aware of we live in a world where there's a lot of contract precarious labor um I people mean, are living myself included contract to contract mm, mm. um and there's not a lot of um support or benefits for part-time folks yeah i know i was reading the other day about google and i didn't even know about this like google has all of the money in the world <laughs> oh, I, well the, they the have, amazon I, exactly <laughs> yeah yeah and um they, they do these things where you're kind of hired okay so you you pretty much come on a project and should that project be done you might get to a new project and that that's a different contract i'm like holy smokes yeah. They do that so they can avoid paying benefits, yeah, yeah, yeah. pensions, all kinds of good stuff that makes people feel secure and safe. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's 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 nuts actually. Yeah. <laughs> so when that was happening last, I was I was like, oh man, I can't believe it. And you one would think, I mean, it's NASCAR, right? Yeah. It's, it's kind of disappointing, actually. Yeah, I Definitely agree. Luckily, though, there was a lot of community support mm. and a lot of support from the students because yeah. the faculty really couldn't have yeah. done this and accomplished yeah. things yeah. without the, the students. students on support because the students are the whole reason that university exists. Yeah. And I think sometimes people forget that, especially <laughs> people in higher up administration. Oh, yeah. And what what was this sign for? Um, so that's something that was kind of, I don't know whether I can officially call that the start. Um, that was, um, I did that a few years ago, mm -hmm. um, after the American election. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think a lot of people were feeling kind of Bumped. like, yeah, like pretty crappy. Um, and I just felt pretty anxious. Like, I don't know that I was 100% a supporter for the other side. They're both kind of problematic. But it was really heartbreaking to see a very, like, qualified woman be defeated. De defeated by a very unqualified man um, <laughs> who... 
yeah, who had a lot of like scary flames. beliefs and yeah. and is currently still like trying to push through yeah. bills and rules yeah. that do not align with like my mm. personal morals and beliefs. Yeah. Um. So I was, like I said, I was feeling anxious and sad and. Like, I couldn't sit still, and I just, like, went into the print shop, and I was like, what am I going to do? And so I printed these posters that say, love still can trump hate. Yeah, Um, Kind of a twist on Hillary's slogan, which was love trumps hate. Yeah, yeah. Um, Because, like, I think love love can trump hate, although sometimes love doesn't look like what people assume it does. Mm. Like, I was, like, I'm... Like, my love sometimes is kind of fierce and angry, but it's protecting people, right? <laughs> exactly. I, I think when you're passionate about something, it shows for different... D- different people express themselves differently, right? I remember on that day of the election, it was Saturday Night Live, mm-hmm. and the cold open was um the, the star... Honestly, she's the star of the show. I can't remember her name now. McKinnon. Mm. She, she sang Hallelujah on the piano. It, it was so beautiful. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna forget about that. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes but- you have to like get off your butt and like do something. And so I printed those, and a number of my friends put them up and down the streets just to try and make our community feel a little better yeah. when everybody was feeling pretty Bumped. bad. And now, we, so when you print, it, is is it like this one? Is it a sequence of times it goes through the cylinder thing? So, cause like the the background color yeah. and then the letter on top. Yeah, so that would have been run through the press twice. Um, the background is multicolored because I was able to do um, it's called a rainbow roll where you put um, multiple colors of ink on the press. So I oh. I kind of pick pink and and blue. Well, it kind of turned turned out a little green on the brown paper blue kind of inspired by like the trans flag yeah and um and then printed the black text over top which is very much inspired by a friend of mine who's a printer named amos paul kennedy jr oh okay um does the background does it have to get dry before you put the um the next text on top um it doesn't have to. Um, people have different schools of thought. To me, it depends on like how much I want to get done in a day and how fast <laughs> a project needs to get okay. done. Um, so that that would have been done all at once, oh. one after another. So it oh, is yep. very possible then, to layer this, things. How long does it take to go through the press? Um, it depends on who's operating the it press. It depends. <laughs> yeah, it depends. Um, so... Um, I'm a relatively experienced printer. I've been doing this for about six years now. Mm. I'm not the most experienced, but I've got a few years under my belt. Um, and I would say I could probably do about 250 to 300 impressions an hour. And that's just me and my little like bicep power. Oh, wait, you you don't just put the paper and let it go? (laughs) No, I gotta gotta get you in the print shop and get you to see. Um, Yeah, no, you crank each one out by hand and you walk along. Yeah, I've got some good blisters from doing runs. Okay, okay. This right here, I did like 1,200. So let me get this. So it's like, oh, I'm coming to the print shop. I like the blackout book. I want to do it. <laughs> so we put each sort. Yeah, each letter. Sort. We put each. Yeah. Le- we go to the sort, get the thing, get the letters we want, put it in the what was that called? Like a base of some kind. Um. Well, it it depends how you want to do it. There's okay. um different kind of levels of kind of lock up, if you will, we call that or lock up. Mm. Um. Sometimes you can get away with um, if you're using larger wood type and a and a Vandercook like I do, um, setting it just directly in the press bed oh. um, and then locking it up from. Wait, 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 wait! Sides. First, is it like just a big square and then you arrange the letters the way you want it to? Pretty much. Oh, okay, um, but then so how do, to... how do they stick? To, how do you lock it up? Is, is, does it like come together or? So we'd fill it out with either spacing or this big spacing that we call furniture. <laughs> it's made of wood. Okay. Um, and then we also use 
um, what are called coins, and it's coins, coins spelt with a Q U. So it's Q U O I N S. Well, that whole one's crumble. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, it does. Or at least words with friends take them. <laughs> okay. Uh, and um, you, they're like these, um, this really cool little piece of technology, if you will, very early technology yeah. that um, is made of metal and it expands when you put, um, there's a key that kind of turns it and it pushes it, it makes oh. it bigger. So um, once you have everything kind of filled out as much as you can, you have these coins in there and you give them kind of the final Twist. tighten and that locks everything in, in there place. really tight. With that other the press that's kind of like this, what, what remind me of the name? The one that you actually have to carry. Oh, um, there's a couple different presses that operate in that, but oh, um, the main one we have around is a platen press. Yeah, so the platen press, right? Do you, you have to keep it down to set it, or it has to stay this way to set it? Um, you can have it flat. To oh set god! It. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, because like traditionally, like newspapers were set like this, so like tiny type, like thousands upon thousands of pieces wait 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 wait. so like when they did newspapers each letter was a thing right like a mm -hmm. like an like an actual letter and it oh man that's crazy <laughs> yeah the the first newspaper in canada was actually printed here in halifax oh and um my mentor joe he set a replica of it and um it's yeah it's just like this giant chase or frame just filled with letters and the first line of the newspaper is an apology for it being late <laughs> and i don't think i need to explain why <laughs> we are sorry your paper is late we have to use do this by hand yeah, <laughs> um, yeah no and it's funny a, quite quite a bit of our equipment came from the herald oh. um and so not all of it um yeah. some of it came from other print shops and some equipment that we no longer have came from there as well mm. so there's different ways of doing things so initially i don't know if the herald ever like they probably did some hand typesetting okay. but then they also moved to linotype machines where you um type out the letters and it casts full lines of type so you don't have to set every individual letter oh. and type them out but then you have to set up the lines and then yes set it in. yeah computers really so the herald used to have like i don't know a few dozen linotype machines probably that's not clacking away all right okay so we put the letters in the cast in the in the what was that base called a chase chase so we put it in the chase get everything all packed up here's the thing though if it's the if it's a huge thing and then we print it this size if you want to print this size that's a huge lot of space we need to cover up though if that's all we are doing so it's all space and furniture and coins to get mm -hmm. it together and then where does the ink go on the cylinder or so just in front of the cylinder is an what we call our inking assembly. There's inking um, kind of rubber rollers. Mm -hmm. um, that That's what runs over our form, yeah. um, kind of because they're spongier. And then underneath that, there's kind of the inking roller, and that's what's powered by a motor. And mm -hmm. so the others sit on top of it, and that's what makes them turn. And when you turn it over, and on top of that, there's two other metal rollers, um, and one of them oscillates back and forth and moves back and forth to try and keep your inking really even oh. um, it's one of the advantages of using um like a letterpress printing press like a vander cook over um say a f like a printmaking press like etching press where you have to brayer it by hand it's a lot easier to get even inking mm. okay so we've got the chase ready put it put the ink on the roller set it and then we start cranking it so yeah. you stay on um how long does the poster need to go through like so our it... presses i want to say the printing area there's sort of this feed board the area where you can like leave your stack of paper mm. um where you put in the paper to like mm. there's this gripper bar that grabs it um that's probably about I want to say like two, two and a half feet kind of long. Mm. And then you've got your big cylinder 
and your inking assembly, then the print printable area of the bed is about 15 and a half inches wide by oh, okay. 22 inches long on the press I use, yeah. which is a universal one. Okay. By Vandercook. Um, and then there's an additional chunk of press after that um, to make sure you kind of get your full and complete com uh, impression. And so the whole press itself from one end to another is, I want to say, about six feet long. Okay. And then how <laughs> many cranks does it take to get to the other side? Um, it actually, with a Vanderhoek, just one... Like one and a half. Oh, okay. It's funny. I've never thought about it before. <laughs> yeah. I've just done I'm it. I'm preparing myself yeah. for when I do it because I'm super lazy. So <laughs> I need well, to Well, if know. you print something smaller, we yeah. can put it in what's called short stroke. So oh, you don't have so to it do it quite boop, as far. And then it's out. Oh, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, that works for me. Um, and then you do that for each paper going through. Yes. So when you said you do 350, you're doing like 700 times to... Yeah, no, that's a workout. <laughs> that's why I got some type. <laughs> also, because like cases of type weigh like seventy pounds. <laughs> what? Well, not all of them, but how up um, to. is is it, uh, so? Hmm. How many? I guess you have to have a lot of letters because sometimes they get missing, right? <laughs> yeah, sometimes, especially with um. A student facility thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Or don't yeah. get put back where they yeah, should. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have, um, most of our type lives in the basement of the print shop. Okay. And I'm told, although I've never counted uh, personally, that we have about 1,500 cases. And a case is like a tray of type. And so, and that goes inside a bigger cabinet, almost like a big dresser. Mm -hmm. um, so, we have quite a bit downstairs, and that's all, but that's all metal type. We don't have nearly as much wood type. Which one is more? Hmm, I guess it's another. It depends. Question, but here we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which one is which one is better? Which one's better? Wood it, and metal. Um, I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> it depends on what you want to do. Because yeah. if you want to print books and small things like business cards or tiny little posters mm -hmm. or something handouts um you really need metal type because uh. um because um they don't wood type i've never seen wood type any smaller than three line ah. um three line um a little a weird unit of measurement um line is the same as a pica yeah and for context there are, it relates to our friend, the point. So if you're looking at like 12, 12 point typeface, mm. um, 12 points is one pike, pica. So a six line piece of type is one inch tall. Oh. I, I know there's a lot of like weird, very specific information that's only makes sense to, <laughs> if you're a letterpress printer. Yeah. Um, so traditionally like wood type, is it made that small? Mm. And I'm sure you can guess why. Like it, it'd be hard to cut really, really tiny, especially a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, the same kind of goes in the opp opposite direction for metal type because they found that once a piece of the, the metal alloy they use is cast, if it was much bigger than two inches, you'd see too much shrinkage in the casting and then it would like alter uh, okay. what you're doing. And so also it'd be letters, like so heavy. So all the big, yeah, yeah, that's so it. So heavy. all the big letter ones are wood. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And then uh, tell me about Steno Press. So Steno Press is quite a new name yeah, for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've just and sort of. Snake and. It's really traditional for um, a printer, much like a publisher. Back in the day, they used to be one and the same, um, to have a press name. Mm. And so I've been kind of debating for a few years now what my press name should be, but I've never really had a need to have a real press name. Mm. On Instagram, I'm KVT Prince. Yeah. I'm KVT Prince because... 
before that, well, it's my name. Yeah, yeah. And I print. Um, and before that, my Instagram name was KVT Knits because I used to be a really serious knitter. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so it just seemed like an easy transition to change it from one to another. But I never intended for that to be like my business name or press name. It was just sort of just, an Instagram name. You know yeah, how it goes? Yeah. And so I've been thinking and thinking. And then I joined this group called the um, Amalgamated Printers Association. Yeah. Um, it, where? Wh- in Canada? Worldwide? Or? Um, they're primarily American, although I believe anyone can join. Um, okay. They asked me, like, in terms of dues, just to chip in a little extra um, because – main purpose of this is a print exchange and so they're like sometimes our canadian members tip it a little bit extra so that um they can cover just like shipping costs because they're not a for-profit organization or anything like that um and so the idea is that you contribute four pieces a year to this bundle and every month i get a fun envelope just filled with different little prints from people um all over North America. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions they ask you when you apply to the APA, because they only take a limited number of members at one time, Mm. just for simplicity's sake, I guess they don't want to be mailing things out to 500 people or something. So they limit their membership to 150 people at one time. Mm -hmm. Um, You have to submit four things a year and... They ask you a bunch of questions, one of which is your press name. You get assigned an APA number. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I thought it was finally time. I'm like, if I want to join the APA and have, like, part of the reason I joined is to, one, to get amazing prints from all these cool people, Mm -hmm. and two, to have a good excuse to do printing for myself. (laughs) Because when you teach and work for people, it's, it's hard to, like, work on your own creative project sometimes. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm gonna end it with this though. What what now that you have Steno Press, the press name, what what's next? Ooh, um just I'm gonna just keep working on my craft. Um I've some exciting opportunities to do so coming up. Like I'll be doing a residency. Oh nice. Um a three week long residency at a place called um, the Antichilly Art Center in Darien, Georgia, oh. in kind of August, September. So I'll be there for three weeks, just getting to work on more creative products. But I would like to kind of more fully move into doing kind of politically inspired and charged printing mm. um, and um, using my press to amplify the voices of people who don't always get heard mm. as loudly as others. Wow. Thank you so much for the amazing work you do and for coming in today, Catherine. Thank you for having me. I had a wonderful time. <laughs> so we need to plan a date for the printing thing so I can come try it out. Yeah, we can do that. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. This is the Blackout Podcast. Thanks for listening.